Hi, good morning. Um, today I'm going to talk about a topic that I'm sure is um, very interesting for many of you. And I know because I've talked with many friends of mine about it and I know it is something that uh, concerns many parents out there. Uh, and it is on, we will talk about how to protect your kids uh, from abuse, uh, from sexual abuse, from abuse in general. Um, and I know it's quite a heavy topic, uh, and this is why it can be also quite tabu and not talked about enough. I need to start with a disclaimer that I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a certified uh, mental health care professional, uh, I'm not trained in helping victims of sexual abuse in any way. I'm just a mother of three kids that also happen to be daughters. Uh, and I've done a lot of reading on the topic uh, because obviously I'm, I want to do whatever I can in order to protect my children. Um, and the thing is that there is quite some material out there. Um, things can also be contradictory and there are different ways to go about it. But today I want to talk about the way that I feel most comfortable with. Uh, and from what I've read, um, it is also a pretty safe way to go about it if you want to uh, teach your kids how to recognize, um, you know, a potential threat in their life and also how to keep an open communication uh, line with your children. Um, you see me looking down because I, I made some notes. I wanted to be as clear as possible. So I took the time to write down a bit things that I want to share with you. Um, first, let me start by saying that I decided to talk about this topic today because uh, in Greece we had yet another um, femicide. Uh, people don't, many people get a bit um, pissed with the term. Uh, I'm sorry, I will keep using it. Um, so there was, uh, if I have my my data right, it was a pregnant woman who got um, who got killed by her partner, by her husband. Um, and anyway, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not going to go into the details. It just came out and I think there is no court yet. So maybe the guy is not even, uh, you know, guilty or I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, what I wanted to say is that very often when there is a femicide coming out or even an abuse of, um, of a man from another man or a woman or, uh, you know, whatever the genders are, um, there is very often victim blaming. There is very often, you very often read comments that say, oh, you know, why didn't she go? Why didn't he leave them? Why did they stay? You know, they've been beaten up. Um, uh, I think this is very, very cruel. Uh, and I think that whoever makes these comments comes from a place of huge privilege. And the reason that these people don't go is either because they don't have the privilege to work on their mental health and on their trauma, and they don't have the privilege to be able to, with the help of a professional, break cycles in their lives. Maybe they grew up with abusive parents in an abusive uh, environment, and they keep repeating that cycle. Uh, but they don't have the privilege to work on that. So if you do have that privilege, if you have worked on yourself, if you have the time and money that this requires, like the least you can do is like shut up. Um, and then there is the other privilege and that is indeed the money. You have many, many people who are stuck in abusive relationships, especially if they are parents that are financially dependent on their abuser. Their kids are financially dependent on their abuser and the family is not always supportive. And especially in societies that are more conservative and that there is a whole patriarchal idea of now you're married, you belong to your man, don't bother us. But also in very much progressive um, societies that people are very individualistic and just don't want to be involved in on your own suffering and tra drama and trauma. So um, no victim blaming, please. It's, it is just cruel. Like if you, if, if you hear, if you read that in the news and the thoughts that come to your mind are, oh, why didn't she leave? What you can do is instead of go and type a stupid uh, judgmental comment that victim blames, just sit down and think, do I have people in my environment, women or men, who I think are not particularly happy in the place they are right now? And if I do, how can I help them? Like, could I go for a cup of coffee with them and listen to them and try to see how they are really doing and what they only present in the outside? Um, is there something that I can practically do to help them? 
Could I offer financial assistance? Could I offer them a place to sleep if they decide to flee? You know, these are helpful things. Uh, commenting on social media about how the victim should have been brave and should have recognized these things uh, and should have left are uh, not helpful, are mean uh, and insensitive. That's how I see it. If you don't agree, you're very welcome to um, unfollow me and not watch the, this video further. Um, I'm sorry I sound angry. It's because I am. Um, so moving on, let's just go to the actual topic of this video and how to protect kids from um, sexual abuse. Um, the first thing uh, that is quite controversial, but it is a measured uh, fact based on data, uh, is that most children are being sexually abused by um, people in their immediate environment. I'm talking parents, grandparents, uh, very often coaches in different kinds of sports, friends of their parents, uh, aunts, uncles, grandparents, Im really immediate environment. Uh, and this can lead to a big dilemma for, for the parents. What do I do? Should I just teach my kids not to trust any adult around them or any uh, older person because kids can also abuse other kids of course but what do i do do i teach my kids that whoever touches them um doesn't mean good or that every touch is a bad touch or that adults should not touch them uh or you know or whatever touch makes them feel good could potentially be a bad touch you know i personally don't think that this is the way to go about it um because I think that children should be able to trust that the world is a good place and should trust that um, their body and their gut feeling and uh, should learn to trust, you know, that if they feel good, most likely, you know, this means that this, this touch and this contact comes from a good place from the other person as well. However, that is the crucial part, that... If they trust their gut feeling, we have to make sure that their gut feeling is not influenced by the things that we keep repeating to them. Like, you know, give grandma a kiss, it will make her happy. Give grandpa a kiss, a hug, it will make him happy. You know, then this becomes their inner voice and they think that whatever touch comes from the relatives, it is actually a good touch because it comes from relatives. So we do need to give them the freedom and we do need to give them the ability to judge for themselves and to develop their own gut feeling without that noise, you know, that comes from social const constructs um so what what do i propose because obviously if you don't tell them don't let anyone touch you if you don't tell them you know you should be suspicious of everyone what can you actually do in order to protect your kids um there are various things that you should do and they start from a very very young age and the first thing um that you can do is actually when you start talking to your kid when your kid learns to talk it is very important to name um, body parts with their uh, with the right names. So you should name, you know, penis for boys and vulva or vagina for girls. You should also be quite clear as the kids are growing up that our private parts include also our chest area uh, and also our uh, anus, you know, because many kids have this concept of, okay, uh, my private parts, uh, it, it's okay if I if I hit another kid, like if I slap them in the bump, it's okay, it's fine. No, it is actually an erogenous area. It is private. It is a private part as well. And this is why actually uh, it has been uh, proven that spanking, like spanking your kids can lead to uh, sexual issues later on, um, apart from all the trauma that comes obviously from, from hitting your kid. But... Um, it is, it is also a private area. Um, and using, why should you use the correct words? Maybe it causes some frustration to you or it makes it awkward if you're sitting at a family dinner and then suddenly your daughter says, oh, my vagina is itching or my, my vulva is itchy. Uh, but just think about it. Would it be um, less uncomfortable if she said, you know, um, I don't know, whatever words people are using in English to name body parts, I don't know. We have lots of stupid words in Greek, but the thing is that if you know your kids uses the right terms, if at some point your kid comes to you and they refer to their private areas with a different name, with a pet name, then you know that someone else talked to them about their private parts with that term. And you can ask them, 
Where did you hear that term? Who is using it? Is it a friend at school? That's, that's how their family calls body parts. Is it a teacher? Is it a coach? Is it an older brother or sister of a friend that she visited? So then you know at least where that information is coming from and you can further investigate and keep an eye on um, that person. And of course, you have to repeat to your child now that this is how we call body parts. This, these are the official, the scientific names, and this is how we call them. Um, in order to, again, be able to, if your child comes to you with different terms for private parts, you know that someone else has been talking to them about their private parts, like your child's private parts, or about their own private parts, showing them their private parts in like worst cases or asking them to touch their private parts. Again, worst case scenario, but you know, um, so this is one thing, using the correct terms. Uh, the second is to teach your kids very early on about consent, limits and boundaries. And I'm not talking just about the private, uh, their private parts, but I'm also talking about teaching them to respect when another child doesn't want a hug or when they don't want a hug or if they don't want to do a high five with a teacher, relative, um, friend, whatever, that they should be able to voice that and say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to do a hug. Do you want a high five? Or, you know, I can wave to you. So give them alternatives so that if they don't feel comfortable being close and intimate with someone, they do have ways to acknowledge the other person, to, to make the other person feel seen. But again, they don't have to engage in any sort of physical contact if they don't feel comfortable. And again, you teach also your child that they should respect other people's limits and they should keep an eye and look and read from their expression and their body language if they really are open and if they're really positive uh, to being hugged or, you know, greeted with a high five or whatever. Um, I think it is quite crucial. And um, if your child has difficulty with reading uh, these cues, please uh, work extra hard with, with them on that topic. Because the thing is that children, unfortunately, even to this day, they are programmed to follow the social norms. So maybe their mouth says one thing, but their body says another. So maybe if you ask a child, can I give you a hug? And the child says, uh, yes, but they're turning away from you. They don't want that hug. You should be able, like as an adult, to read that cue, you know. Um, and if until now you didn't, please don't, don't feel guilty, but start noticing more the body language of little people. It's not that they're shy. Most likely it is their polite way of actually telling you, I, I, no, I don't want that hug. But society doesn't let them do that, you know. Just try to respect that more, like the subtle cues of... Um, of children, especially. Um, and then the next is, um, yeah, I already mentioned it about gut feeling, like teaching your child to really listen to their gut feeling. And with little children, it's, it's quite easy because they can really feel many things in their belly. And you can really tell them, you know, they do have that body-mind connection that many of us adults have lost. So you can just tell them, uh, how do you feel in your belly when you are with this person? Like, how do you feel in your belly when aunt is hugging you or when your uncle or your grandpa or your teacher, you know, you can say, you know, oh, I noticed your teacher gave you a hug today. How did that feel in your stomach? And hopefully your child will say it felt all warm and fuzzy or it felt really nice or I don't mind, you know, um, but maybe they can say, oh, you know, I felt my belly a bit tight. I felt my belly a bit weird or I had a bit of a belly ache. Children have a very good connection with their body. If we um, and if we don't damage it, if we don't break it by telling them, you know, don't cry when they need to cry or eat more when they don't want to eat more or, you know, uh, don't laugh when they feel like, you know, laughing. So if we don't keep blocking their bodily expressions, they have this good connection with their body. They can really listen to their gut feeling. And again, what I mentioned at the beginning, if from a very early age you start pushing onto your child's social norms, then highly likely, instead of their gut feeling, they hear their inner voice, which is your inner voice, which is what would people say? We shouldn't offend people. And don't get me wrong here, I am one of the people who is <laughs> quite easily <laughs> annoyed with kids that are overly rude or inconsiderate of other people's needs, but I think that there is this thin line of um, teaching your child to trust their own feelings and their own needs, but also respecting the boundaries of others. So that is, I 
I do realize that's a very thin balance and it is hard to achieve. And sometimes your child will respect the, the boundaries of others more and maybe they will not respect their own needs or feelings. But it is trial and error. But don't get me wrong, I do not advocate that kids should do whatever the hell they want in expense of other people younger or older. Because again, consent and boundaries of other people should be respected too. So just keep trying. This is, uh, you know, this is a learning phase. Like childhood is a learning phase. We also learn hopefully as adults as well. And social norms do also change. So that is another factor to to take into account, another factor. Um, So after gut feeling, another thing that is very, very important to teach to your child is to actually, um, they are not responsible for how other people react when they tell them they do not want a hug, a kiss, a high five, uh, to spend time with them. Uh, Because what many uh, predators will actually do is try to guilt trip the child and be like, you know, oh, I'm so alone and I thought we could be friends and I was so happy that you would hang out with me or, you know, I feel so good when you give me a hug and now I'm all sad. No, it is obviously twisted and sick and... I'm sorry, but even if it comes from from grandparents or from relatives, uh, it is unacceptable to guilt trip a child into spending time with you um, in that way. Do you want your child to spend time with you? Make sure to pay attention to what they say to you, to be interesting, to be interested also in what they want to tell you and what they are doing and earn that attention. Guilt tripping children into, into getting attention from them uh, is just completely selfish and just plain wrong there is no no two ways about it um and you have to teach your kids that if an adult tells them that they made the adult sad because they don't want to hang out with them this is the adult's problem this is not for the child to solve they should not feel bad about it and the adult should wonder why they're not pleasant company and why they make the child feel uncomfortable being around them. It is not the child's issue, and the child should always, always feel comfortable and safe to come and tell you those things. So imagine that your child is coming and is telling you that, Mom, you know, we had a gym the other day, and as we were changing clothes, the teacher came and asked to help me undress, and I didn't feel comfortable with it, and I asked him to stop, but he insisted that he should help me because I couldn't get my shirt off alone or something. Um, if you immediately, uh, you know, react very shocked and, you know, like, oh my goodness, then the child feels that you can't handle it and they will stop talking to you about it. It is very important to remain calm and just ask the child for more information and more details and ask open questions. You can ask the child, why, you know, why do you think that is the case? Why do you think your, your gym teacher acted that way? Or, you know, um... Did you ask help from someone else and the teacher came to help you? Or can you tell me in more detail what happened? And don't try to fill in the gaps uh, yourself. You know, I, I actually, I already did that by saying, you know, did you ask help from someone else? And then the teacher came. It is already like I'm trying to find an excuse for the teacher because I don't want to think of the bad scenario. So, but don't do that. Just listen to your child, ask for more details, keep calm. And then obviously directly contact the director of the school and say what happened. Like, immediately um so it is very important to to offer to your child a variety of trusted adults to talk to because the thing is if your child only trusts you as an authority and as the absolute truth or if they only trust their their father or you know um i don't know teacher grandparents first of all they are more susceptible to abuse because Maybe the person you trust the most ends up being your abuser and grooming you and abusing you. But secondly, maybe there are things that your child doesn't feel comfortable talking to you about because they know you're not comfortable you know, talking about these things. Maybe they have noticed while growing up that with specific topics you tend to overreact or feel overwhelmed so they wouldn't want to upset you. So it's important that your child has you know, other trusted adults in the environment. So that is actually your job to find those adults, pre-scan them, pre-screen them, and encourage your kid to form a bond with them um, so that they do have more options, uh, especially during puberty, that it is a very natural process to rebel against your parents and try to find your own 
identity and your own um, self. Uh, it is really good to have someone else to talk to that uh, that they can trust and that you, of course, first of all, as an adult, trust that will give you will give your child um, sound advice about these things. Uh, and I personally think it is not a bad idea to talk beforehand with with these trusted adults about how you see specific things so that they know how they could talk to your child. And of course, they're allowed to, you know, put their thoughts as well there. But it's good that you are in line with, with the trusted adults in your child's um, life, right? Um, uh, and then, yeah, offer the variety. Yeah, no victim blaming. I already said that in the beginning of the video. I couldn't help myself. But that is also important. Like the no victim blaming, it is really important. Also, if your child um, does happen <coughs> to get into a situation that... Uh, there is uh, there is abuse, sexual abuse specifically, um, or otherwise. Also, that uh, if your child comes to you and says, you know, oh, you know, uh, I noticed that my teacher was all the time, you know, looking at my shirt, and then you tell your daughter, uh, yeah, but you know, I've told you not to wear these very short uh, shirts at school because then you expose so much skin, and uh, they can't help themselves. Um, no. No, obviously not. Um, and again, uh, when it comes to clothes and school, I'm not so black and white because I do feel there are um, appropriate. There is an appropriate dressing code for every situation. You know, I'm not religious, but if I go to church, and I know that it's a conservative church, and women tend to go there wearing skirts, and men wear their you know nice clothes and stuff. I will not go with a torn jean. It doesn't cost me anything to go wearing clothes that show my respect to the space where I'm in. Um, so in that sense, while I do 100% believe that women should be free to wear whatever they want and girls should be free to wear whatever they want, I do also believe that dressing according to the place you're visiting and uh, according to you know the event you're going to also shows emotional maturity and respect. So just to clarify that part. Um, I also wanted to, to close this video that I'm sorry, I know it's very dense and very intense, um, but I feel very passionately about this topic, you know. Um, so to close this off, I wanted to recommend two books. Um, unfortunately, the one is only in Greek. I will start with the one that should be translated in other languages. Uh, this is by Dr. Uh, Catherine Dolto, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, it's a French um, doctor, and it is called um, I Respect My Body. It's a wonderful book that talks actually in very simple terms um, about body, and it has like pictures of, uh, you know, male and female bodies of children, and it also has some really nice illustrations that can help the children realize you know, what happens if you're with a relatives and then a relative is taking you apart and is trying to get their own kind of attention from you. It also explains that it's completely illegal from adults to get pleasure from children and some adults know that but they can't help it and that is illegal. Um, and it explains many different, you know, um, many different ways that you could be in danger, like having adults offer you things or ask you to go uh, to get gifts from them and what you should do, you know, you should immediately yell, shout and run. Um, and it also explains that, thank God, you know, there are so many loving touches that you, we can enjoy and intimacy that we can enjoy with people who genuinely love us and care for us and care about um, how we feel. Um, and I like how it ends because it says I'm I'm reading for the from the book, my own translation. So probably the English, the official English translation is much better. But it says, "You did well talking to your parents, even if this upset them. You did well talking about what you lived, and together we can discuss about the way that all this happened and how you felt. I can help you so that this experience will not leave a heavy weight on your heart and your life from now on." So even if it does happen, even if sexual abuse does happen, there are ways and tools for the kid to not carry that trauma their whole life with them. As long as it comes to light, you know, as long as they trust you, they have a trusted adult enough to uh, talk about it. And the second book, oh, by the way, this is a series. There are more books about different topics. I haven't gotten any other books, but 
Uh, it's also about boys and girls, uh, good and bad, screens, anger, I see here. And in Greek, the series is called So Simple, Tosho uh, Apla. And from, from the book I read, like, I highly recommend it. And then there is another book, a really cool book. This one in Greek, Kohilaki Sideftes, is the Greek title. Um, and I will present it in English as well, but it, it is, a, I mean, maybe you, maybe you do speak Greek, even though you're not Greek, so maybe it is relevant. So it talks about a little a seashell here that is not listening to its mom and it goes deep into the water and it meets this crab that is very friendly at the beginning and it takes uh, the little uh, seashell into deep water and then, uh, you know, suddenly it becomes kind of darker and it tries to hug the little seashell and the seashell doesn't feel nice about it, uh, feels really bad and runs away but is hesitant to talk to its mother because its mother had warned it already not to go away, not to go with strangers. So the little seashell actually feels guilty about it. But the mother stays calm and open and says, you know, just talk to me and we will deal with this together. And it says, it's not your fault. And this is also the title of the book, you know, it's not your fault. Um, very nice book. I have to say that even that with these two books, um, kids can understand a lot. Even kids from the age of um, four, I would say, uh, can understand a lot. And um, I realized how much it really gets into them because the other day uh, my youngest, who is now almost three, asked to read them. And my middle one said, yeah, mom, I'd like to read something more relaxing because these books are about important topics and then they make me think a lot before bed. So I don't like them for bedtime stories, which is good, you know. Uh, and I know I don't talk about those issues the whole time. Like, it's not that my kids wake up and I start like, you know, human rights, uh, racism, sexism, um, you could be abused. No, but they have to be part of life, you know, and we will sparring, like we will talk here and there, read a book here and there, among other books about these topics, like keep a bit of a balance, but also make sure that the kids... Um, are reminded of these things every now and then so they can protect themselves. Uh, that was that. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm sure you're not more cheerful after this video, uh, but I hope you found it interesting uh, and inspiring. And if you do disagree with some of the things that I am saying, I am open to uh, productive dialogue and uh, to productive feedback and uh, criticism. I'm not open to discussing terms like uh, femicide and um, patriarchy and uh, this kind of things at that at, at this moment anyway uh, in my life because I have a lot in my head and I cannot um, I cannot spend the time to give detailed answers to that kind of uh, debate uh, on my page. Um, have a nice day. By the way, that this is where I make most of my videos with all the plants behind. They're not there. I am I'm doing work, you know, for the moving. Like shelves are off, plants are off. I'm very proud of me. <laughs> you should also be proud of me because you know I need the support <laughs> to keep going with the packing. Um, have a lovely day, and uh, we talk soon. Bye bye.